Shaw TV, your local voice. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jeff Lewis. Jeff is a faculty member in the Geography Department at Vancouver Island University here at VIU, where he teaches Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. Jeff has expertise in working with large-scale climate models used to predict past, future, past and future climatic trends. He is also a faculty mentor for awareness of climate change through the Education and Research, a university-based initiative to promote a greater understanding of the science and social implications of climate change among students and the general public throughout Vancouver Island and coastal BC. So please welcome Jeff Lewis. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, when David Witte asked me to give this talk, he said that you as architects know the building and design solutions to combat climate change, but be maybe less familiar with the uh, science and causes of climate change. Uh, hopefully my talk today will clarify how we know that climate is changing and that humans are the main cause of present day climate change. Uh, and with that knowledge, then we can better support appropriate actions and policies to prevent more extreme climate change. So to, uh, to start, I'll outline the overwhelming burden of evidence that the climate is changing and that humans are the main cause of climate change. Uh, and then go through just cause of climate change in general. I find that uh, often, unless people truly understand what causes climate to change in general, so throughout Earth's history, they uh, are less likely to understand or, I guess, have, have trust in the science of knowing that climate is, is being changed today by humans. Uh, second half of the presentation, I'll go into the examples of present-day climate change, or some of those examples. So looking at the temperature record, obviously, and sea level rise, uh, ocean acidification, which is often not talked about, which, but is also one of the most important uh, implications of climate change and then talk about extreme events, which uh, is usually the most talked about uh, because it's, it's uh, what the media picks up on. It's very sensational. Uh, and at the end, I'll talk about ways to avoid more extreme climate change. So first of all, the overwhelming burden of evidence. The uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, is a, a group of science, scientists uh, under the, the UN that goes and summarizes all the latest peer-reviewed research uh, and they write a, a summary report every five to seven years or so. And the report is literally thousands of pages long, and the media tends to pick up on, on one statement. And this is the one that they picked up on from the last assessment report. Uh, it's extremely likely, and by that they mean greater than 95% certainty that human influence has been the dominant cause of observed warming uh, since the mid-20th century. And that's about as strong a statement as a group of scientists can make. Uh, no one is ever going to say that it's 100% uh, certain, uh, more than 95% certain is, is uh, a scientist's way of saying that it's essentially it's fact. And it's not just the, the IPCC and the United Nations that's saying this, it's every national uh, science academy. So all the groups of scientists from different nations around the world all agree with that statement. So it's not uh, one scientist or one group of scientists, it is science organizations all around the world that support uh, the fact that climate is changing and that we humans are the main cause of present day climate change and that there's enough certainty to justify taking actions uh, as promptly as possible. And we've seen that obviously with the Paris Agreement uh, and moving forward here. Uh, the other thing to note is that it doesn't matter what the administration's perspective on climate change is from all these different countries. It doesn't matter um, whether it's, it's uh, our current government or our past government or in the US. Uh, again, governments from China, India, uh, Russia uh, all agree, or the scientists all agree with this statement. Uh, and why? Why is there the sort of overwhelming consensus that the climate is changing, that humans are causing it, is because that's what the, the evidence points to. So there was a study that came out uh, just recently. Uh, there's been actually many studies looking at the, the science itself. Uh, and what this is trying to show actually is a pie chart. So this big blue circle here is uh, the number of, of peer-reviewed 
research papers that came out in 2013 and 2014, more than 24,000 of them, and only five articles, this very thin wedge, uh, came out against climate change or that humans were causing it. So we can see that in this case, the, the consensus is greater than 99%. And again, it's not because people are just getting together and agreeing, it's because when they objectively review all the peer-reviewed science, uh, you can't come to any other conclusion. And it's not just scientists. So the, uh, the US military has been publishing reports about climate change for, for quite some time now. Uh, this one here, the 2014 Climate Change Adaptation Roadmap, uh, has statements such as uh, you know, that climate change is a threat multiplier, meaning that it's going to exacerbate all these pre-existing conditions. Uh, they say that the impacts of climate change will intensify the challenges of global instability, hunger, poverty, and conflict. Uh, and the Department of Defense sees climate change as a present security threat, not just a, a long-term risk. Uh, and again, anyone that has had to deal with the implications of, of climate change have accepted that climate change is happening. Uh, the insurance industry is, a, is another organization uh, globally that uh, obviously has been tracking climate change and, and costs for quite some time. Um, so to summarize the, the last big uh, summary report by the IPCC, so the group of scientists that are reviewing all the research, uh, this is about as concise as, uh, as I can make it. So humans have caused the majority of present-day climate change. Uh, the warming is largely irreversible, so the things that we're doing now uh, is very difficult to undo. Uh, most of this, most of the heat is going into the oceans. Uh, the current rate of ocean acidification is unprecedented. In fact, it's unprecedented over geological timescales. <clears throat> and to stay below 2 degrees Celsius of warming, most of our fossil fuels have to stay in the ground. And that last statement is, is profound, obviously. Uh, so the 2 degrees Celsius warming, that's something that uh, the world's nations agreed to at the Copenhagen Accord in 2009, and again reaffirmed in the Paris Agreement uh, just this past year trying to stay well below two degrees Celsius. And it's not that there's a magic threshold, it's that we needed some target to be able to, to put forward. Um, and over the last 800,000 years, the climate has been a little bit warmer than now, maybe up to about two degrees warmer. We have a reasonably good understanding of how climate behaves, maybe up to two degrees warmer than pre-industrial. But once we start to get beyond that, uh, climate starts to destabilize and we start to have much less of an idea of how the climate is going to respond. Uh, and it's essentially about risk management. So the more that we can do now, the more that we can avoid more extreme climate change in the future. And so the target that's been set, again, by the, the world's nations is two degrees Celsius. Um, and if we burn the fossil fuels that we know are in the ground and are economically viable now, we are going to greatly exceed that. And I'll come back to that point later. Um, so, the, the scientific evidence for climate change is overwhelming, uh, and yet the, the opinions from, from public is, is not the same. So this was sort of a, a series of, of studies done since 2011 looking at public opinion in Canada, uh, and we can see that uh, Earth is getting warmer, it's about 80%, uh, and I think the reason why this is so high is that people are starting to uh, almost perceive that things aren't normal. They're not like they used to be. Uh, there was a, a study a while back, it was actually quite sad from a, a science perspective, asking people uh, why they believe that climate was changing, and scientific evidence rated as one of the bottom ones, unfortunately. Uh, but near the top was that people had experienced climate change. And whether or not that it was actually linked to climate change is sort of irrelevant, but people tend to believe what they they can see and feel and, uh, and know what's happening around them. And, and we've seen a lot of extreme events, whether it's been flooding or uh, drought, heat waves, and people are starting to, to think this is not normal. So again, in Canada, about 80% of Canadians feel that the, the climate is changing. Uh, is it changing mostly or partly because of human activities? It drops down to 60%, uh, and if we look at it, it's mostly human activities, it drops down to 44%. And again, this is compared to the science that is fairly, uh, you know, the IPCC has stated greater than 95% certain that we are causing present-day climate change. 
So there's this disconnect. Uh, and that's really the purpose of this talk today, is that often people don't understand what causes climate to change. And if people have a better understanding of what causes climate to change in general, then they're much more likely to, uh, to uh, be able to evaluate the science uh, and see that it's us that's causing the climate to change now. Uh, on the plus side, the, the uh, study went a bit farther and looked at support for doing something about climate change. So forms of carbon pricing, whether it's cap and trade or a carbon tax, and there is public support for some form of, of uh, carbon pricing. Obviously, if you throw tax into any statement, people don't like it as much. Um, but if we call that carbon offsets, it would probably get a, a higher response. So uh, the next part of this talk, we'll talk about the main causes of climate change. And the very first thing that we have to do, obviously, is, is distinguish between weather and climate. So weather is the instantaneous state of the atmosphere at any given time. It's what we want to know in the morning when we decide to head outside. Do we need to put a jacket on? Do we need to bring an umbrella? You know, what, what's happening with weather? Uh, we also know that weather is highly variable. Uh, there's sort of that five and five rule around here. Wait five minutes or go five kilometers and the weather is, is different. Um, and you'll probably experience that uh, this weekend as well. Again, it's highly variable. Uh, and we can't predict weather because it, it is uh, very variable over short time scales. So everyone's looked at the forecast. Uh, you look at something for the rest of the week and often it's completely incorrect. Uh, we're pretty good at forecasting the weather maybe a day out three days out, not too bad, and beyond that, uh, not very good at all. And past five days, it's pretty much garbage. It's, you know, you'll see websites with 14 days of, of forecast, and it, it's just pure fantasy. Um, and that's weather. Um, and that's why I'm not a meteorologist. I'm a climatologist and study climate, because climate is the average of weather. And typically, it's the average of weather over a very long time scale typically 30 years, and we might go down as short as, as 10 years. But to give you a, a quick, say, analogy of weather versus climate, uh, there's no way that I would be able to tell you that the weather, say, on Christmas Day, although around here it's you know, a good bet that it might be wet. Um, but I can certainly tell you that it's going to be colder in December than it is in July. Uh, and again, our seasonal climate, we understand what controls the climate. We understand that, it, that it's Earth's tilt. Uh, we're tilted towards the sun or away from the sun, and that changes the amount of energy that we receive from the sun. So we understand what causes the climate to change, even though we can't predict the weather. And we're going to focus on, on climate today. Um, so going back into Earth's history, we're going back 400,000 years, looking at temperature from the ice core. Present day is way over here, and this short little squiggle that's horizontal here is the last 10,000 years. So we can see that the climate has changed substantially, over the last 400,000 years, from being warm to North America being covered in snow and ice. Um, and if we look at the temperature change, so compared to present day, the difference between now and North America covered in snow and ice is about 8 degrees Celsius. So just to give you a perspective, when we start talking about a 2 degrees warming, um, globally average, that's, that's quite significant. And again, the Earth has been a bit warmer in the past than it is present day. but you know, not much beyond two degrees. Once we start going past that, uh, we start getting into a very unknown area. Um, obviously, the, the uh, humans have not caused all of this to take place, uh, and the emphasis here uh, today is going to be looking specifically at more recent climate change, so looking at climate over the last 100 to 150 years. And this is a temperature record that we have now. Uh, and compared to pre-industrial, we just had 2015 was our, our first year where we actually exceeded that one degree Celsius threshold. Um, so we are now one degree warmer than pre-industrial, so we're halfway to getting to uh, that two degrees Celsius threshold. And we can see that this is continuing to go up and up. Uh, again, this is just one year, and we try not to emphasize one year. If we look at, say, the last uh, 10, 20 years, we've warmed about 0.8 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial. Um, all right, the, the main causes of climate change, ultimately the sun is our, our main source of energy. Uh, and this is a really simple equation. In has to equal out. And if the two are in balance, then our climate is relatively stable. And if in no longer equals out, uh, then we are no longer in balance and our climate will change. So typically, we've got sunlight coming in. The sun's really hot. 
So the, the light that enters the atmosphere is in the visible spectrum. We can see it. Uh, and it, our, it goes right through our atmosphere. And then the uh, thermal energy from the Earth goes out into space. And in general, it's relatively stable. But anything that, uh, that causes that to change, we call a radiative forcing. So that, that radiative energy, uh, whether it's incoming solar radiation from the sun or outgoing thermal energy from the Earth, uh, will cause an imbalance. And these are the five main causes of climate change, period. So over Earth's entire history, if the Earth's climate is changing, it's due to one of these main factors. So we can have external forces, such as changes in how much energy is coming from the sun, or changes in how the Earth orbits the sun. We can have changes in how much energy the Earth's surface actually absorbs or reflects. And then we have uh, sort of a redistribution of energy through, through atmospheric and oceanic circulation. And then the last one here is changes in atmospheric composition. And the main thing to remember is that all five of these are acting all the time. Uh, it's just that at any one time and over any given length of time, some of them are more dominant than others. Uh, and I'm going to, to address each of these in more detail and look at when they've been more dominant and what's been the most dominant one now. Uh, so if we look at changes in solar output for our time scale, looking at present day climate change, we're really talking about the, the sunspot cycle. So every 11 years or so, there's more of these dark spots on the sun. And when there's more dark spots on the sun, there's slightly more energy coming from the sun. It's about 0.1%. So it's not a huge amount, but it's enough to make a, a bit of a difference. Uh, and we've been recording sunspots actually for, for hundreds of years. So people have been staring at the sun, counting the sunspots. Uh, and we can see that back here during what's called the Maunder Minimum, the Earth was quite a bit colder. Uh, and that corresponds to fewer sunspots. But if we look more recently, we can see the 11-year sunspot cycle is all the blue, and the black line is this average. From 1900 to 1950, we had this sort of slight increase in the average energy from the sun. But since that time, over the last 50, 60 years, the energy from the sun has been relatively constant or even slightly declining. And so if we compare this to temperature, so here's temperature from you know, 1900 to present day, we can see that, again, this rise up until about the, the 1940s corresponds to a rise in average temperature from the sun. But since about 1950 or so, the average energy from the sun has been relatively stable or even slightly declining and cannot explain the warming that we've seen over the last 50 or 60 years. So yes, the sun is very important for our, our temperature and our climate, absolutely. But can it explain the warming that we've seen over the last 50 or 60 years? Absolutely not. Uh, it can't. Uh, so the, the next uh, uh, main cause of climate change is Earth's orbit. And Earth's orbit can go from more circular to more elliptical, but it changes over 100,000 years. Uh, the tilt in Earth's axis can change. Uh, and again, that changes over a time scale of 41,000 years. And then whether our North Pole is pointed towards the North Star or away from it, again, changes on about a scale of 19,000 years. And the only thing to get from this slide is that it takes so long for these things to change that uh, this force is insignificant for the time scale that we're looking at right now, which is climate change over, over the time scale of decades. Uh, what it's not insignificant for was looking at the last 400,000 years. So we see we're going from warm to cold to warm, and it's about a time span of, uh, of 100,000 years, and it's thought that Earth's orbital changes have been the dominant cause of uh, sort of glacial, interglacial periods for the last uh, 800,000 years, actually. But it can't uh, explain present-day climate change. So now we start to look at internal forces, and when the first one is our energy balance. So if we look at uh, energy balance, uh, the main one being how reflective is the Earth's surface? And the way that we change this is through land use change, deforestation and urbanization. And they have different effects, and most of the effects are, are relatively localized. So if we cut down dark trees and replace it with cropland uh, or clear cut, then the Earth actually reflects more sunlight. It doesn't absorb as much, and that's a local cooling effect. Uh, obviously, if we burn those trees, then the carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere and, and is a warming effect. Uh, and then our urban areas here uh, are, are an urban effect. We're replacing sort of a natural ground. Uh, we are making impermeable surfaces, and we're changing the hydrological cycle. But we're also darkening the surface, and it's absorbing more energy and causing uh, the urban areas to heat up. 
uh, in general, land use change is not as significant as, as greenhouse gases, which we'll get to. Uh, one thing that's come out in the last five to ten years or so is looking at where is all this energy from uh, global warming going. Uh, and more recently, they've discovered that most of the heat, 90% of the heat from global warming is actually going into the oceans. So this thin brown wedge here is our atmospheric temperature record, really, well, heat content. But this is the atmosphere. This is what we've been concentrating on. Uh, and really, most of that heat has been going into the surface waters of the oceans. And it makes sense. Uh, the oceans have a, a vast capacity to absorb energy. Uh, and this is also why the oceans are starting to rise. They're, they're heating up. And that thermal expansion is one of the, the two main causes of sea level rise. Uh, changes in circulation. This is, uh, is very important for the temperature on any given year. And there's lots of different changes that take place. But the, the one that, that dominates year-to-year -year variability is really the El Nino-La Nina cycle. And we've been hearing a lot about that in the media lately, because we've just gone through a really significant uh, El Nino in 2015. So uh, normal conditions in the equatorial Pacific is that the wind blows from South America over to Indonesia. Uh, and what it does is it takes all this warm surface water, and, and you know this is the tropics, the sun's beating down on it, and the surface water is very, very warm. But it takes all that warm water, and it skims it off the top, and it piles it up over here off of Indonesia, and most of that really warm water is buried down deep in the ocean. And so it's not in contact with the atmosphere, and it actually brings up cooler water from, from deeper down. Under El Nino conditions, this wind, the trade winds that are blowing from South America to Indonesia actually weaken and sometimes uh, reverse. And all this warm water that was stored down deep uh, out of contact with the atmosphere gets spread over the entire equatorial Pacific. Uh, and it's like having a really big hot water bottle sitting underneath the atmosphere, and it heats up the atmosphere. Uh, and it can have a significant influence on the temperature of that year. So if we look at the temperature record up here since 1950, to this one's to 2010, we can see this is the same temperature record we looked at before that's been increasing since about 1950. Uh, what's being shown down here is whether we had an El Nino event, so a warming event, or a La Nina event, which is a cooling event. So La Nina is sort of the extreme of normal, where the winds are blowing really, really strong and bring up a lot of cold water. So this is what La Nina looks like as far as temperature uh, changes from normal. So it's really cold water. It cools the atmosphere. And El Nino, again, lots of warm water at the surface. And it heats the atmosphere. Uh, and so we can see something like 1998, which was uh, one of the warmest rec uh, temperature years of, of uh, temperature record. It's actually still one of the top 10. The reason why it was so warm, it was a really dominant El Nino. Uh, and then after that, it cooled, and we had a La Nina, and so on. And you can see that a lot of the wiggles here match up with the wiggles from the El Nino and La Nina. So uh, changes in our equatorial Pacific ocean circulation actually have a strong control on the temperature of any given year. What they can't explain is the trend. So this increasing trend here is, again, not caused by the El Nino, La Nina, but the year-to-year the -year variability is. Uh, one of the other things I really like about this, this uh, graph, even though it's quite busy, is that it also shows the volcanic eruptions. So here we have Mount Pinatubo and El Chichong. Uh, and again, it goes to show that at any given time, one of these climate forcings will dominate over another. So volcanoes, uh, and I'll talk more specifically about them very shortly, but volcanoes release a lot of soot and ash into the atmosphere, and it basically darkens the sky and it blocks sunlight. And so they have a cooling effect for a year or two. So even though we had this quite strong El Nino, the volcanic eruption dominated that and overpowered it. So again, it's a very uh, sort of small-scale example that all of these, these uh, main causes of climate change are happening all the time, but at any given time, one or more will be more dominant. So to summarize this again, a lot of the, the wiggles, a lot of the, the weather almost in our temperature record is caused by changes in the ocean circulation in the Pacific from uh, El Nino to La Nina, but it still cannot explain the overall increasing trend. Uh, this is a, another graph uh, showing very, something very similar, except it's showing 
the change in temperature from an average time period, in this case the average is 1950s, 60s, and 70s, and the bars, if it's down, then it's colder than that time period, and if it's above that line, then it's warmer. And they've also colored the bars, so if it's an orange bar, then it's an El Nino year, if it's a blue bar, it's a La Nina year, and if it's a gray bar, then it wasn't either. It was just normal conditions. And they've looked at what's the trend like if we looked at just the years that were El Nino or just the years that were La Nina. Uh, and they basically show the same trend. Uh, and what we can see again here is uh, 2014 was the previous record for global average temperature. And what was significant about that is that it wasn't an El Nino year. It was just a normal year. Uh, obviously, 2015 was an El Nino year, which is why it absolutely shattered the previous records, uh, and it's thought that it will continue to influence into 2016, uh, and there's a very good chance that 2016 will actually be hotter than 2015 as well. So we've talked about changes in solar output, changes in how Earth orbits the sun, uh, changes in surface energy balance and, and ocean circulation. Uh, the last one here is changes in atmospheric composition. And there's two things that can change in our atmosphere. We can have more particulate matter. So uh, either tiny liquid droplets or solid particles, soot, dust. Um, and they tend to, the, the, the aerosols or the particulate matter tend to block the sun. And so you get this cooling influence. And again, uh, naturally the, the volcanic eruptions tend to have a cooling effect for a year or two. But because these aerosols, the, these particles are heavy, they tend to fall out of the atmosphere after about a year or two. So it's a very strong cooling influence, but for a short time period. Uh, and then the very last one. So greenhouse gases. A greenhouse gas, by definition, is one that is transparent to the visible light coming from the sun, but it, uh, it absorbs and re-radiates that thermal energy that the, the Earth is giving off. Uh, and the reason why they give off different wavelengths of energy is because of their temperature. The sun is very hot. Uh, it's about 6,000 degrees Celsius, and so the light that we get from it is, again, in the visible spectrum, and greenhouse gases are transparent to that. So the sunlight can come in. Uh, Earth is much colder. It's about 15 degrees Celsius or so, um, and so it gives off energy in the, in the thermal spectrum, in the infrared. Uh, and that's the, the wavelength that the greenhouse gases absorb and re-radiate back down. And the greenhouse effect is actually a wonderful thing. Without an atmosphere and without the greenhouse effect, the Earth's average temperature would be minus 18 degrees Celsius. So having this natural greenhouse effect is what has kept Earth habitable throughout Earth's history. Uh, but what we're concerned with is that we are putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere that are exacerbating this natural greenhouse effect. So the greenhouse effect naturally accounts for about 33 degrees of warming, so minus 18 compared to present day 15 degrees Celsius above. Uh, and it's like we're putting the greenhouse effect on steroids, where we're, we're ramping it up uh, and we're starting to get into areas that we know very little about and that climate starts to destabilize uh, and we get much more extremes. And if we look at what the concentration of greenhouse gases has done over the last, say, 2,000 years, uh, just to note that these axes don't go to zero, so this isn't, you know, a tenfold increase. Uh, but if we look at carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide has risen, obviously, exponentially since the pre-industrial times. And this year, it's uh, around 402 parts per million. It goes up about two parts per million every year because of the greenhouse gases that we're putting in. Uh, other greenhouse gases, we have methane and nitrous oxide, and the only thing really to, to get from this graph is that they've been relatively stable for a very long time period, and they are starting to rise exponentially. Uh, in fact, greenhouse gases uh, are at their highest level that we've recorded over the last 800,000 years looking at our ice core records. And we know by definition that a greenhouse gas uh, traps thermal energy, uh, and so it's the only thing that can explain the warming that we've seen over the last 50 to 60 years. Uh, one of the ways that we can test this is we can look at our, our climate models and we can try to uh, recreate the observations. So the observations in this case are the black line on this graph. So the black line is our actual temperature record and we can use our climate models which are, are basically computer simulations where we know how the earth and the atmosphere and the oceans exchange heat and, and moisture. 
Uh, and we can put in just natural forcing, so just the solar forcing and volcanic forcing that I've talked about. And if we did that, since about the, the middle of the 1900s, the Earth's temperature should have been relatively stable or even slightly declining. We should be cooling. Uh, if we were just looking at, at the sun and volcanoes. And, I mean, we could come to that conclusion ourselves. We looked at the average energy coming from the sun, and we saw that it was slightly stable or slightly declining. And volcanoes, those are these episodic cold blips that last a year or two. Uh, that's, that's what the natural forcings are. But if we put in the natural forcings as well as human forcing, mainly greenhouse gases, we can see that we can represent the warming over the last 50 or 60 years very well. Uh, and again, it's, it's essentially um, almost impossible to come to any other conclusion that greenhouse gases from humans are causing climate to change. When we've looked at those five main causes of climate change, uh, some of them can, can change uh, sort of year-to-year -year temperature, but the only thing that can explain the rise in temperature over the last 50, 60 years is greenhouse gases. Uh, unfortunately, greenhouse gases are not the, uh, the only thing to happen. So what we put into the atmosphere can actually be amplified by the climate system itself. So water vapor is also a greenhouse gas, but uh, because it doesn't stay in the atmosphere very long, it can't cause the climate to change. Uh, if we were all to take garden hoses and spray it in the sky, uh, the rain would just fall out. So we, we can't force water vapor into the atmosphere. But what we can do is we can heat up the atmosphere, because we all know that warmer air holds more water vapor. And so as the temperature increases, because we put more CO2 into the atmosphere, the warmer air can hold more water vapor. Uh, we get an enhanced greenhouse effect, and that uh, further increases the temperature. Uh, one of the things that we talk about in, in uh, climate modeling and climate science is the sensitivity of the climate. So if we were to double the amount of carbon dioxide, so from pre-industrial, it was 280 parts per million, and we double that. How much would the, the climate warm? Uh, and the general consensus right now is it would warm by 3 degrees Celsius. One degree just from the carbon dioxide that we put into the atmosphere. Another whole degree just because of this feedback alone. And then the third degree is because of other uh, feedbacks, such as uh, snow and ice melting. So when snow and ice melt back, so this, this is just an image of winter versus summer for the Northern Hemisphere, but uh, when we have more snow in the Northern Hemisphere, it reflects more sunlight, and therefore it, uh, it's cooler. And when there's less snow and ice, then more of that sunlight is being absorbed, and it, and it warms up the temperature. Uh, we've been able to, uh, to look at how much uh, energy has been absorbed uh, since 1979, so 1979, 2008, and we can see where this absorption is taking place, and it's all in the margins of Arctic sea ice uh, and the, the extent of our snow and ice. So we're seeing already that we can measure how much energy is being absorbed by this other feedback, sort of this self-reinforcing cycle. So as snow and ice melt, uh, it reveals a darker surface, more of that sunlight is absorbed, which further amplifies the temperature and further melts that snow and ice, and so on and so forth. Um, and again, that contributes to uh, magnified warming in the Arctic. Uh, and again, a study came out, this is in 2014, so a couple years ago, saying uh, that they found that the Arctic was already 8% darker. So again, more evidence that this is in fact taking place. So the second half of this presentation is going to focus on uh, uh, examples of present-day climate change. So oftentimes you hear about climate change as a problem that's going to take place somewhere else and somewhere in the future, uh, or sometime in the future, and really we've seen a lot of profound changes already. So the, the image that's up here right now is from this past February, which was the warmest February in recorded history over the last 136 years, uh, and it absolutely again shattered the previous records by uh, half a degree Celsius which is significant for a global average. And we can see that the pattern of warming is uh, what we'd expect. There's more warming over land than the ocean because land heats up faster than the oceans do, but there's also much more warming uh, in the northern hemisphere and around the Arctic because that snow and ice is melting and it's absorbing more sunlight and amplifying the temperature. Uh, again, as a climate scientist, I would caution looking at any one particular year, or in this case, one month, and so we can look at the same sort of thing, looking at an average over a decade, and we can compare the 2000s 
to sort of a, a normalized period between 1950 and 1980. And we're looking at the change in temperature. And it, it's very similar to what we just saw, that we're seeing warming occurring more over land than over the ocean and much more uh, up in the Arctic again because of that very powerful snow and ice uh, feedback. Uh, and we can see that the warming that's taking place is between 1 and 2 degrees Celsius, even though for a global average temperature, this represents only a half of a degree. So global average temperature in this case is half a degree Celsius. Uh, that doesn't mean that every place on the planet warms by half a degree. Uh, a lot of it is amplified. So uh, typically, uh, again, the Arctic is warming up at two to three times the rate of the global average. Uh, and that's going to pose a lot of problems for, for us in the north and our northern communities. This is just uh, recently, this was in March, where uh, ironically a fuel tanker uh, went through one of the, the ice roads. Uh, and again, we will see more melting of ice roads, more melting of permafrost, and it will be much harder to get resources to and from our northern communities. So the global average temperature record, uh, again, looking, concentrating mostly on the last 50 or 60 years. Uh, we've already looked at a, a similar figure here. And I just wanted to put it up because this one shows three different groups that are all studying the same thing. So one's in the UK, the Hadley Center, and the other two, NOAA and NASA, are in the US. Uh, and on any given year, they may differ in what the absolute temperature is, but the overall trend here is, is the same. And in fact, I think there's uh, six or seven land-based data sets, and there's two uh, satellite-based data sets, and they're essentially all saying the same thing. Uh, and again, just to highlight 2015, uh, it is very high. But we know why it's, it's high. It's an El Nino year. But the reason why this El Nino year is much higher than this El Nino year is because of greenhouse gases and climate change. Uh, a different way to view the same information, instead of looking at, I'll go back one, instead of looking at the year-to-year -year variability in the wiggles, which is sort of the weather, we can look at what the temperature was like from one decade to the next. So again, we're looking at the average changes. And when again, we can see here's 1970, 1980s, 1990s, the 2000s, and the 2010s are on track to be even warmer. So again, we are seeing that the temperature continues to go up and up, uh, and we know why. Uh, this uh, image here is going to kick in. I just discovered it yesterday, actually. Uh, it's, I will let it go through a couple times. It's showing the temperature changes, plotting it actually every month since 1850 in a visual. And as you get closer to the outside, so 1850 starts at zero here. And here is one and a half degrees, here is two degrees, and it's plotting every single month. And again, it's just a different way to visualize how the temperature has been changing since 1850. And we can see, obviously, we've been warming. Uh, through the 70s, there's a bit of a contraction. And we're starting to, to warm at a higher rate as well. One of the, the things that we struggle with uh, as scientists is how best to communicate. So anytime we can find uh, sort of novel ways to show the same information, uh, it, it helps. We'll watch it one last time, and then I'll, I'll move on. So temperature rise, uh, other impacts, sea level rise. So looking at some of the recent headlines, Vancouver near the top list of cities threatened by rising sea levels. For good reason, Vancouver is on a, on a delta. Uh, it's already very low, uh, low land. Uh, Canada's east coast, uh, most vulnerable to rising sea levels. This is a, a recent study that just came out in February again. So our coastal communities are obviously uh, very impacted by sea level rise. Uh, if we look at, at how sea level rise is compared in this uh, century compared to previous centuries, we're looking at the last 2,000 years or so. Obviously, sea level has been changing over the last 2,000 years, but this really highlights what's happened in the last 100 years. Uh, sea level has risen substantially compared to the last 2,000 years uh, and is continuing to do so. Uh, so Looking at uh, the sea level rise that we've already had, we've already had 20 centimeters of sea level rise since the pre-industrial time. That's already impacting uh, areas 
you don't think that 20 centimeters is very high, but when you start to put on storm surges uh, and, and the high tides and everything else on top of that, it can make a significant difference. And if we start to look at where we might be uh, by the year 2100, typically the range is for a best case scenario, sort of around half a, a meter, and a worst case scenario from the IPCC anyways is about uh, 1.2 meters. Uh, but if we look at the breadth of research around sea level rise, typically uh, the general consensus is that it'll be around one to two meters by the year 2100. And obviously that has a, a major issue for coastal erosion, for uh, all the agriculture that's in our, our deltas uh, near sea level. And if we look at uh, cities that have more than 10 million people that will be affected by sea level rise, this map highlights what percentage will be impacted for a two degrees Celsius warming versus a four degrees Celsius warming. Uh, obviously a lot of the low-lying areas, uh, the uh, Ganges and Brahmaputra deltas, uh, Nile Delta, um, New York as well, saw that with Hurricane Sandy, very susceptible to, uh, to sea level rise. And this, of course, ignores all the, the island nations, that their, their nations are only one to two meters above sea level anyways, uh, and a number of them are looking to relocate the entire nation because uh, it will be underwater by the end of the century. Uh, increasing ocean acidification. Uh, again, a UN report uh, warns that our economy could lose billions if we don't do something about it. Uh, the global economy could lose, be losing as much as one trillion annually by the end of the century if we don't take urgent action. Uh, and the thing about ocean acidification is that uh, the carbon dioxide that we're putting into the atmosphere, not all of it stays there. Only about half of it stays in the atmosphere. Uh, about a quarter of it goes into the oceans and about a quarter of it is taken up by the, the terrestrial biosphere or, or plants on land. Uh, and the, the CO2 that goes into the oceans reacts with the water and forms a weak acid called carbonic acid, and it basically makes the, the ocean more acidic. Uh, and a lot of our, our phytoplankton, the base of the food chain, our corals, have shells made of calcium carbonate that dissolve in, uh, in acid. And what's happening here is that, uh, again, the base of our food chain and our coral systems are starting to, to dissolve. Uh, and this will only get, get worse going into the future. Uh, and the importance of ocean acidification cannot be understated uh, or overstated. It's uh, even if CO2 and greenhouse gases had nothing to do with climate change, if they had nothing to do with increasing the temperature, had nothing to do with uh, rising sea levels, this alone, the fact that the CO2 that we're putting into our atmosphere is going into the ocean and causing the ocean to become more acidic, is enough for us to take urgent action to try to stop putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere uh, because it has a, a massive influence on our ocean ecosystems and, uh, and we rely on our oceans for, for so much, whether it's for, for food, whether it's for tourism, whether it's for even pharmaceutical products. Uh, so far, to date, because of the CO2 that we've already put into the atmosphere, our surface ocean water has already become about 30% more acidic. Uh, and it's already affecting marine creatures. Around the Southern Ocean and uh, in the North Atlantic, uh, where the water is colder, it actually absorbs more CO2, and therefore it's getting more acidic sooner than the rest of the ocean. We can see that uh, this was a study done, I believe, in 2012, where the pteropods, these tiny little uh, phytoplankton shells, uh, we're starting to dissolve. They actually see uh, right now that shells are dissolving because of the, the acidification that's already occurring. And if we continue on our current trajectory, the oceans will become more acidic uh, over the next 200 years than we have seen in the geological record over the last 300 million years. And again, this is something that we are doing over uh, you know, the span of one generation is having an impact over something that we haven't seen over 300 million years to highlight how uh, significant our impact on the environment is. Uh, of course, the ones that, uh, that the media picks up on and that we tend to, to hear about and pay attention to are the extreme events. So in this case, just a, a couple highlights, uh, the, the drought in California, which has been going on for a while now, 2015 was very heavy, uh, $2.7 billion cost to that. Uh, the 2011 
drought in, uh, in Texas, $7.6 billion. Both of these have been linked to climate change. Uh, not to say that climate change is solely responsible for these, but climate change has definitely been part of amplifying uh, and lengthening the time of these. There was a, a wonderful paper that came out in 2012 by James Hansen and, and others looking at uh, essentially how things have changed statistically. Um, and what they did, and this takes a little bit to explain, but bear with me because it's important, is they looked at how the, the area of the Earth was changing. And they said, okay, if we just take a, a normal time period, let's say the 50s, 60s, uh, about a third of the world is going to be normal temperature, about a third of the world will be hot, and about a third of the world will be colder than normal. Uh, and that's what they did. They just said, these are the, the sort of the hot areas here, this is the very hot, and then extremely hot. And what's happened through time, and this has nothing to do with computer models or anything else, but just looking at how weather has changed, and uh, in this case, hot areas, we can see that what used to be uh, hot about a third of the area of the globe is now more than two-thirds, so almost 80% of the globe is considered hot compared to the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, and if we look at where the extreme events are coming from, very hot, so what's only happening about 2% of the time is now happening, uh, a, a, or it's covering a third of the area. And then what used to cover such a small fraction, this is our extreme heat waves, uh, is now covering 10% of the globe. So we have seen a significant increase in the extreme events. And what was so important about this paper is that before, whenever uh, climate scientists would be asked, was this event caused by climate change, we would always have to say, no, we cannot say that climate change causes any one event, but this is consistent with the trend of increasing temperatures and so on. Uh, and what they did is they switched the question around and says, what's the chance that this event would happen without climate change? And because of that, because of switching the question around, the chances of a number of these events that we've seen lately of happening without climate change is almost zero. Uh, very, very minuscule probability of happening naturally unless climate change has influenced it. So extreme temperature events are now five to ten times more common than they used to be in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, and there's groups that are studying this all the time. So the last, uh, since 2011, there has been groups that have published a special paper looking specifically at the extreme events that are taking place and trying to determine the influence of climate change. Uh, and in their the reports, human activities are influencing specific extreme weather and climate events around the world, and over half of these extreme events show a linkage to human-caused climate change. Uh, not to say that half of all extreme events, but half of the ones that they were looking at. Uh, and again, uh, not just scientists know this very well, but anyone in the insurance industry obviously has been keeping track of the costs. Uh, climate change could present more threat than anticipated to the insurance industry, the Standard and Poor's, uh, and very recently CBC insurance industry aims to reduce huge losses from climate change extremes. I mean, we look at the losses that we've had, and we've got um, you know, uh, drought, flooding all through the prairies, we've got the, the floods that happened in Alberta, uh, again, the wildfires this year, um, there will be groups that are studying uh, and looking at the linkage to, uh, to that as well. So, uh, avoiding more extreme climate change, we're looking at sort of zero here represents roughly pre-industrial temperature. Uh, the black line is where we are now, or at least to the, to the year 2005 in this case. Uh, and then these are different computer... Uh, simulations depending on which, what, what we decide to do ultimately. So the blue one would be our best case scenario. This is where as a global whole we come together, we realize this is a real problem and we make uh, very concerted efforts soon to do something about it. So for the blue one, our emissions peak essentially now and start to decline and we're able to stabilize the climate. This is at two degrees of warming that we are attempting to, uh, to stay below. Uh, the red line here is business as usual. This is where we don't try to do anything about it. We continue to run out of oil and we switch more to coal and we continue to burn coal. Uh, and by the year 2100, we can see that the blue line gives us a pretty good chance of staying below two degrees Celsius. The business as usual, uh, we're around four degrees with a span from three to five or so. 
Uh, and the reason why they've now projected it out to 2300 is to remind people that our future doesn't end at 2100 and that the things that we do now actually has uh, significant implications going forward as well. Uh, what I do want to note is that if we stay down here, this bar is fairly well constrained. We have a pretty good idea of, of what the climate's going to do if we can keep it low. If we don't, if we start to go up here and we start to destabilize climate, we have uh, not a very good idea of how things are going to change. We do know that uh, things will be far more extreme and it probably won't be good for us. Uh, so we, we want to try to stay down here. Uh, from the last assessment report, the, one of the, the main conclusions from it was very significant. And this is the graph that they chose to present that, which is truly unfortunate because it's horrible. Uh, it is it's horrible for trying to communicate this information. But what it's showing here is that the total human uh, carbon dioxide emissions that we're, we're putting out is proportional to temperature. So these are different scenarios, and there's all sorts of uh, sort of error bars on that. But ultimately, what they're trying to show is that as total carbon emissions go up, the temperature goes up proportionally. And that's essentially it. And it's profound. It allows us to understand uh, where we are now. So we've burned more than 500 gigatons of carbon, which is why we're roughly at 1 degree Celsius above pre-industrial. What it does do is it allows us to backtrack. Here's 2 degrees Celsius. We know that if we want to stay below 2 degrees Celsius, we can only burn up to 1,000 gigatons total, period. And we've burned more than half of that already. Uh, so to put some uh, other lines on here, right now we're about here. In 2014, we burned about 545 gigatons of carbon. Uh, and to avoid 2 degrees Celsius, we only have a total of 800 to 1,000 gigatons carbon, period. Um, this roughly, and these numbers will change depending on the sources, but the overall magnitude is the same. So we can burn. It means that we have a carbon budget. We know how much carbon we have left that we can, let's call it, uh, safely burn, although we, we'd rather not even get close to 2 degrees Celsius. But this is what... Uh, our budget is. This is the current proven reserves. This is what we know is out there and is economically viable right now. This is what uh, companies have already invested in extracting. And this is the potential reserves. Uh, you know, 1,500 gigatons more. So we're way out here. We're, we're up in the four degrees range. Um, and this has led the fact that, you know, our, our carbon budget is much smaller than what we know is in the ground and available to uh, the term unburnable fuels, unburnable carbon, uh, meaning that uh, depending on whose numbers you're looking at, we can only burn 20% to a third of the carbon that's left in the ground, our proven reserves. Uh, coal is by far the worst, so 82% of that has to stay in the ground. Uh, roughly half the gas has to stay in the ground, and, and a third of our oil has to stay in the ground. Now, because all these companies and investors have already put a lot of money into uh, finding this oil and, and gas, and actually are continuing to put more money into it, uh, we talk about the term stranded assets. So if the world is truly serious about doing something about climate change and policy comes into play that restricts our ability to extract these fuels, then all of that money that's been invested, the money that's being invested now, uh, Stato Oil just announced they've discovered a couple uh, oil um, uh, deposits right now, all of that money is basically wasted. Uh, and we talk about a, a carbon uh, bubble or an oil bubble. Mark Carney, obviously uh, governor, former governor of the Bank of Canada, current governor of the, the Bank of England, uh, is talking about stranded assets. The insurance companies are concerned about this, investors are concerned about this, and there's more and more organizations that are um, divesting, so they are taking their money out of fossil fuels, and for very good reason. It probably makes financial sense if we start to do more about climate change. So doom and gloom is not the best way to, uh, to motivate change. We've tried it for years, decades, and it does not work. Um, the best way to motivate change is to have a, a vision. 
Um, not a strategy, not a plan. Again, Martin Luther King started off his uh, inspirational speech with, I have a dream, uh, not I have a 12-step plan to, uh, it, it doesn't work. Uh, and our sustainable vision has to be highly positive because people want to have to, uh, they, they want to be part of that future. Uh, if, if people don't want to be part of that future, then it's not going to work. So we have to create a, a highly positive uh, vision. It has to be believable. It has to be practical, right? We can't all pack up and move to Mars. Uh, and it has to be responsive in that it has to actually address all these pressing challenges that we have. And climate change is one of them, but it's exacerbating a lot of pre-existing issues already. Uh, it has to be economically, socially, and, and uh, environmentally sustainable. And we have a vision. We know the path that we want to take, the, the future that I would like to live in and have my, my kids raised in. Um, and we know what we want to avoid. But we have to actively advertise that. And actually, as architects, you're in the perfect place to create that visual vision of the future of, uh, of green, walkable, livable cities uh, that people would want to be a part of. I'm not going to go into uh, too much detail over the next couple of slides. I'm just looking at the time here. Uh, but essentially to say that there are lots of different groups that have looked at different ways to get there. Uh, this group was looking at, again, becoming um, almost 100% renewable energy by 2050 using existing technology. And this is what would happen to carbon dioxide. It would decrease substantially. We would uh, solve a lot of problems, climate change, our energy problems, a lot of environmental problems, and water problems as well, because we use a lot of water for extracting fossil fuels. Uh, the way to do that is sort of an all of the above approach, but using renewable energy. So phase out nuclear, coal, natural gas, and oil, uh, and ramp up uh, wind, solar, and uh, geothermal, and, and bio uh, as well. And what is also significant about this is that about 50% of our future demand for energy has to be met by energy conservation. So it's not just enough to find new sources of energy, but we have to start to become far more energy efficient. Uh, there's groups that are, are looking at ways that different countries, this is the Solutions Project that's looked at every state in the US and determined what proportion of renewable energy would work for that state. They've just come out with one for Canada as well, uh, using solar plants, using a lot of onshore and offshore wind, and obviously using our existing hydroelectric as well. Uh, and so if you're interested more about this, they've got much more than just this slide. It goes through, uh, obviously, jobs and the cost of things, but um, the, uh, the benefits to health and everything else, it, it's great. Uh, other groups. So this is uh, the, the new climate economy report written by a number of the, the top economists in the world. It was commissioned by seven different countries. Uh, very comprehensive report. Some of the, the key statements, uh, we should be integrating climate into core economic decision making, phase out subsidies of fossil fuels, uh, introduce strong predictable carbon prices. Actually, BC is looked to as a, as a, a leader in that case, the way that we've done our, our carbon tax shift, uh, and make connected and compact cities. And really, again, as architects, that's uh, what, what you play a key role in. Uh, one of the last slides here is that policy can make a significant difference. The Economist came out in 2014 and looked at all these different things that we have done. What has made the biggest influence on reducing climate change already? Uh, looked at Montreal Protocol, uh, different uh, power options, so hydropower, nuclear power, one-child policy in China, all these different things. The numbers themselves are probably a ballpark. But what stands out is that the Montreal Protocol, which we implemented back in uh, 1989, uh, had nothing to do with greenhouse gases. We realized that, that CFCs, carbofluorocarbons that we were putting into the uh, chlorofluorocarbons that we were putting into the atmosphere, uh, were destroying the ozone layer. They were creating the ozone hole over Antarctica. Uh, they were causing skin cancer, and we needed to do something about it. Uh, and we did. We actually. Uh, basically banned CFCs and reduced them, and the number of CFCs in the atmosphere has been declining since. It's one of our real great success stories. Uh, without the Montreal Protocol, CFCs would have gone uh, far higher. Another thing about CFCs is that they're actually a very powerful greenhouse gas. And so by banning or phasing out CFCs to deal with the ozone hole, we actually prevented a lot of climate change as well. 
Uh, and this is really powerful because it's a great example of you know, choosing some of our most powerful greenhouse gases and trying to phase them out or ban them can have a really significant impact. Uh, last slide is just to look at, at Canada's greenhouse gas emissions. And this is from Environment Canada. So 2005, we're here. Uh, this will, came out in 2014 or 15, and it was, ends in 2014 here. This was the, the 2020 target that the Harper government uh, established, and this was the, the 2030 target, again, that they established. And this is Environment Canada's own projection of where we're on track to go right now, unless we start to implement significant policies. And that's the discussion that's taking place across Canada right now, is how can the federal government work with the provincial governments and actually do something to get a, you know, to these targets and, and hopefully even better. Uh, so to, to summarize, humans have caused the majority of present day climate change. Uh, in order to avoid more risk and more extreme climate change, we need to try to stay below two degrees Celsius which means that most of our fossil fuels have to stay in the ground. Uh, we have a positive sustainable vision. We just have to uh, implement it. Uh, and we can still do it with existing technology. And then the last one here is that with the increased knowledge and education, we can support actions and policies to avoid more extreme climate change. Uh, and that's, that's the purpose of the talk today, because our, our politicians are going to be trying to make some very tough decisions uh, in the coming months to uh, hopefully a year or two, and, uh, and hopefully they can have a lot of support. So thank you very much.